Heavenly Father, this morning, as we open your word, I ask that you send your Holy Spirit to speak to our hearts. Help us to understand, even if it's a human way, how great your love for us really is. Bless us now in Jesus' name. Amen. A couple years ago, my boys asked for one thing over and over and over again. They wanted a treehouse. Now, if you have kids, you probably have had the same request to ask of you to get a treehouse. Daddy, will you build us a treehouse? We really want a treehouse. And I've been there before as a kid. I always wanted a treehouse as well because you think of this grand idea as like we can have campouts up there. We can take snacks up there. We can spy on people from up in the treehouse. Treehouses just have this grandeur that you just can't wait to, to have one. But let's be honest, we all know that treehouses cost a ton of money and they rarely get used, am I right? Sometimes I guess they use them a little bit. I have never seen a treehouse that's really used. Well, as, uh, as they were begging for this treehouse, I kept pushing them away a little bit. Well, let's just wait a little bit. Lumber prices are really high right now, guys. Let's just, let's just wait a little bit. And we kept pushing it down the road, pushing it down the road. Just down the street from our house, there was a new construction that was happening. It was a big, uh, some sort of a, a church, I guess is what it was. And they had poured a foundation, concrete foundation. And the workers had used two by fours and two by sixes to make the forms for the concrete cement walls. And as we drove by this new construction, we noticed one of those roll-off dumpsters that was sitting there, and it was full of two-by-fours and two-by-sixes ready to be hauled off to the dump. And as we drove by, I realized what I was looking at. I was looking at a treehouse just waiting to be built. It's like a treehouse from Ikea. Everything's there, you just gotta put it together, right? So on a hot summer Sunday morning, my boys and I loaded up into my pickup truck. We drove the half mile down the street to this job site and we went dumpster diving, didn't we fellas? That was fun. We were in there throwing two by fours out, loading the truck up. We pulled over to the, the house after we had it loaded. They unloaded them, you know, teamwork. One on front, one in the back, moving, moving the boards, making a big pile. By the time we were done, we were already spent, but we, we still forged ahead to make this treehouse. And so we spent all day building this treehouse. Now these guys, they helped a lot. In fact, I have a video of them working hard. They, uh, they used the chop saw that day. I put this video on Facebook and I got a lot of feedback and a lot of flack from some parents as they said, where are their safety goggles? It's true, bad parenting right here. But they, they, they both can still see fine, so we're okay for now. <laughs> Next time we'll use safety goggles, guys. But these fellas, they measured. They had a tape measure and they'd put it at one end of the board and they'd pull it down and they'd say, what are the dimensions, Dad? How far do I need to go? Uh, we needed eight and a half feet. Okay, they'd find eight and a half feet and make a little mark. How, how wide do you need it, Dad? Well, I need it a two by six, so it needs to be six inches, which is actually five and a half inches. They'd measure, okay. How, how deep do you need it? Well, I need it about two inches deep. They'd measure. They knew the dimensions so well by the end of the day. And by the end of the first day, here's what our treehouse looked like. Here, there it is. Up in the tree, kind of looks like a teepee, actually. Uh, we had uh, swings down below it already, and so we just kind of built a platform up there. There's Caffrey David up there working with me up, up in the treehouse. A few days later, it had a roof on it. Here's what it looks like. Kind of cool, right? Free! I didn't pay a dime for this bad boy. Look at that thing. And then by that afternoon, here are my two guys hanging out in the treehouse, just chilling. I mean, that's living the dream right there. What a project. The HOA didn't like my treehouse, that's for sure. <laughs> in fact, they made me paint the roof because it was uh, so obtrusive, apparently. But by the end of this project, we knew how to measure things. We knew the dimensions, the length, the width, the height. We knew how deep it all was. We knew the dimensions. Have you ever thought about the dimensions of God's love? I mean, so often we think about God's love as a pinpoint event that happens on the timeline of history as God becomes man and dies for us and we say that's what God's love looks like. It was a momentary memory that we look back to and we think it happened then. 
Have you ever thought about it being multidimensional? This morning, if you've got your Bibles, I invite you to open them to Ephesians chapter 3. Ephesians is in the New Testament. It's one of the small little books that Paul wrote. If you don't have your Bible with you, you can open up the Pew Bible. It's the blue book in front of you, and you can turn to page 828, and that's the same page you can read right along with us. I'll give you some context while you're turning there. Paul, he's writing to a group of Gentiles, not the chosen people of God, the ones that take the message to the world, but he's writing to Gentiles, ones that have received the, the, the good news, and he's giving them the best news ever. He's saying, even though you aren't chosen, God's love is bigger than that, and you are now invited to be a part of the family of God. He died for you too. And as he's writing to these Gentiles, he also begins to pray. And we get the prayer in Ephesians chapter 3, starting at verse 14. If you're there, say amen. amen. We are ready. Okay. Ephesians chapter 3, starting in verse 14, here's what it says. Paul says, For this reason I kneel before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. I pray that out of his glorious riches he may strengthen you with power through his Spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. He says these words, I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. And to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Did you know that verse was in the Bible? It's kind of cool, isn't it? Paul says, I want you to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. Four dimensions, 4D, four-dimensional love. I, I don't know exactly what Paul was trying to say as he writes this, but I'm sure that he's trying to say there's more to God's love than just an event that happened at one point in time. You don't understand it fully, but it's four-dimensional love, 4D love. And so this morning, we're going to let the Bible describe the four dimensions of God's love. Can we do that today? Yes. Okay. First service was really quiet, and I feel like it's just kind of bleeding into second service, y'all. It's okay if you say an amen once in a while, just saying that. All right. Let's start with the first dimension. It's the easiest one. The height. The height of God's love. Can you measure God's uh, love in height terms? You can. Here it is. It's in Philippians. Here's what it says. The Bible says your attitude, Christians, disciples, should be the same as that of Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. The height of God's love is from the highest of highs to the lowest of low. He's the creator, supreme being of the universe. He's at the top, there's no one greater than him. And he says, because I love you, I will become human, I'll become a baby. No, no, a baby born in a barn so that I can grow up, so that I can die for you. Highest of highs to the lowest of lows. God's love's height is from the highest of highs to the lowest of lows but there's more dimensions. The next one, this is an easy one. The length, boy, I lost myself in my notes there. This is an easy one, I love this one. The length of God's love. Now, when you measure length, you've gotta have a starting point and an ending point. Right now in my kitchen, in my living room, I've been laying tile on the floor. And if you've ever laid tile or any kind of flooring, you start at one end and you work across the room till you get to the other side. And then you've got to measure that piece to know how much you need to cut off so it'll fit in there. And you put the tape measure on one end and you run it across to the other and you mark your spot. So you've got to have a starting point to know the length of something. When it comes to God's love, how do you measure it? How long is it? Is it just a few feet in front of each other? Do you have to zoom out on Google Maps to see the length of his love? The length of his love is pretty uh, impressive, I think. In fact, the starting point is given by David in Psalm 139. Here's how he describes it. He says this, For you, God, created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. 
Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place. When I was woven together in the depths of the earth, your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. The starting point for God's love is before you were even born. He loved you before you ever breathed the first breath. He loved you before you were even an idea. Way before you were created, he loved you. The starting point of God's love is way before you were born. In fact, every parent in this room understands this completely. When I was up at seminary, up at Andrews, a place that I don't need to go back, whoo, I think 40 degrees is cold today. It's cold up there. Jen and I were up there, and as we were enjoying life as a married couple, we thought, you know what, we could just be a married couple and have a dog the rest of our lives, but we want to make the Smith family bigger. And so we began to dream about kids, and we began to pray about kids, and we didn't know if we'd have boys or girls, and it didn't matter because we just began to pray for them. And we'd say, God, we don't know the decisions they're going to make. We don't know the relationships they're going to have. We don't know the mistakes they're going to make, but we want to pray for them. Before they were even born, we loved them. Long before they were created, we loved them. Before they were really a full idea in our mind, before we were sure we wanted them, we loved them. And God's love is the same way. The length of his love starts long before you were created, way before you were even an idea, before you had life or experiences or family or relationships. He loved you first. The beginning of the length of God's love started way before you were born. Now, does it have an end point? Does the length of God's love have an end point too? Well, here's how uh, David puts it in Psalm 136, because he asks the question, or, or he makes the statement, he says this, give thanks to the Lord for he is good. His love endures how long? Forever. Ah, he says it again, give thanks to the God of gods. His love endures? Forever. Give thanks to the Lord of lords. His love endures? Forever. His love, the length of his love starts long before you were born. And it goes on forever and ever and ever, well after you're gone. And what I love about the length of God's love is it doesn't stop no matter what you do. In fact, I've had some incredible people in my life and I've had had the privilege of giving Bible studies to some incredible people in my life and this next verse blows people's minds every time they read it. Uh, Here's what it is. It's in Romans 8. It says this. Paul says that neither death nor life Neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Isn't that powerful? His love started before you were born. It goes long after you're gone, and there's nothing you can do that would make God stop loving you. Somebody needed to hear that this morning. I mean, what a, what a sermon in a message. God's love doesn't stop no matter your bad decisions, no matter how bad your self-esteem is, no matter if you're struggling in your marriage, no matter what failures you have, no matter how unworthy you feel, no matter how much drama is in your life, there is nothing that can separate you from the love of Jesus. It started long before you, and it'll go long after you too. But there's more dimensions Paul doesn't just give us a couple. He gives us four of them, four-dimensional love. He talks about the width of God's love. God's love is not only uh, high, it's not only long, but it's very, very wide, too. Incredibly wide. In fact, there's a little book that I can't tell you how many times I've read to my kids. Here's a picture of the book. I bet you've read it, too. Anybody read read this book before? No. Uh, Seriously, though, has anyone read this book? Raise your hand. That's what I thought. See, I couldn't tell. It's like half the congregation. It's a fantastic book. Guess how much I love you. The story goes of a daddy bunny and his son bunny. And they're, they're having this conversation. The whole book is a conversation between the two. And the whole time, the baby bunny is trying to out love the dad. And so he'll do everything he can to prove his love to his dad. He, he stands on his hands and he puts his feet way up in the air and he says, Dad, I love you all the way to my toes. 
And the daddy bunny does a handstand. He says, and I love you all the way to my toes. The baby bunny thinks for a minute and he tries something else. He hops as high as he can hop and he says, daddy, I love you as high as I can hop. And the daddy bunny takes one big bound and he says, and I love you as much as I can hop. Finally, the little bunny stands on top of a tree stump and he says, dad, I love you as, well, what does he say? I love you this much. And the daddy bunny says, and I love you this much. And that's how God's love is too. It's so wide that you can never outlove God. The width of his love just stretches and stretches and stretches and goes on and on and wraps around and draws people in. I, I believe God's love is like a searchlight that searches every dark spot in humanity looking for people to tell that he loves them. It never ends. No matter what poor choice you've ever made, no matter how far you want to try and hide from him, his love will find you because it's that wide. In fact, in Psalm 139, David asks the question. Here's what he says, Psalm 139. He says, where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you're there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me. Your right hand will hold me fast. There's nowhere you can go to flee from God's love. His love is too wide. He even goes beyond just stretching out his arms. He wraps them around us. That's how wide it is. It's, it's so wide you can't run from it, and he just pulls you in, and he calls you family. In fact, in 1 John, here's the word. Here's what it says. See what great love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called children of God, and that is what we are. That's powerful. It speaks to me today that the love of God is so wide that it wraps around humanity and pulls us in. And God says, I love you this much and you are my children. You can never outlove God. His love is as from the highest of highs to the lowest of lows. It's from before you were born to long after you're gone. It's, for, it's so wide that you can't even run from it. But there's one more dimension that I find a little bit uncomfortable. The first three are pretty easy. This one's a little bit harder this morning. Makes me feel uncomfortable. It's the depth, the depth of God's love. David puts it this way. In Psalm 139, he says this, Oh Lord, you've searched me and you know me. You know when I sit and when I rise. You perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out and my lying down. You're familiar with all my ways. Before a word is on my tongue, you know it completely, Lord. Man, that's a little intense to know that no matter, before I've even said the words, he knows what it is. Before I've even thought the thought, he already knows what it is. Before I've even done the act, he knows what it is. It's scary to know that God knows everything in my heart and mind before I do, and he loves me anyway. His love is so deep that it goes deep inside my heart and my mind, and the beautiful part about it is his love is what cleans me up. It goes so deep that it's like a refreshing bath, a refreshing pool on a hot summer day in Florida where you fall into his, his love and his grace and his mercy and you think, man, my life needs to look more like what he wants it to look like. And it's like it washes you because of his love. It makes you clean. Honestly, I don't think that we will ever understand God's love completely. No matter how many dimensions the Bible says it is, his love is unfathomable. It's incomprehensible. It's it's amazing and awesome, and I don't think we'll ever fully understand it until we're in his presence together. But until that day, I just want to bask in it and enjoy it, all the dimensions of it, from uh, the highest of highs to the lowest of lows, from before you were born to long after you're gone, from uh, so wide it wraps around everything, so deep that it can even cleanse you from sin. You know, there's a story that I read recently about a family of five. Here's a picture of them. They went hiking in Colorado. 
uh, on the Agnes Vale Falls Trail, beautiful waterfall at the end, and as they're hiking along, they see, uh, they look up and there's the cliff above them breaks loose, and the rocks come tumbling down, big rocks the size of cars coming down. And in a moment flash, the dad, his name's Dwayne Johnson, which I get hung up on because the only Dwayne Johnson I know is The Rock, right? You know Dwayne Johnson? I mean, this guy's pretty ripped, but I ain't no Dwayne Johnson. Anyway, this is Dwayne Johnson, the dad. In a minute, he has to think, what do I do? Who can I help? And so he grabs his oldest daughter, that's Gracie, on the left, and he stretches the whole length of his body over her body, and he wraps his wide arms around her, and he pulls her in deep towards his chest, and he covers her body, and as the stones come crashing down, there's only one survivor, and it's Gracie, because of the love of her father, the dimensional love of a dad that kept his daughter alive. That's what God's love is like. It's, it's higher than high to low. It's longer than from before you were born to long after you're gone. It's wider than anywhere you can run from. It's deep enough to touch your heart and cleanse you from sin. That's the awesome, indescribable, extravagant love of the Father for you and me. This morning, I don't know which part touches you and your heart the most. I don't know which dimension really impacts you. But I pray that the Holy Spirit pushes you to understand his love at a different level and it makes you do something about it. May we all go and grow deeper into the incredible love of God.